From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. This episode, I would say, is something that we should all consider an introductory episode. It goes a lot of places. We're we're essentially going to going to walk to the front of some rabbit holes and then we're going to leave it up to you how far down you want to dive in those on on your own time but this this episode has some past for us in an earlier listener mail segment uh one of our fellow conspiracy realists struck a chord with a lot of people uh when they brought up a place that is today known as the rocky flats national wildlife refuge but do not let that name fool you This thing does have a past, and it remains controversial today. Why? Well, here are the facts. Uh, You know, first question you might ask if you missed that uh, listener mail segment, or if you don't read all the emails we get is, uh, hey, guys, where is Rocky Flats? How did it get there? Why should I care? Like, I got stuff to do. Why do I have to learn about this? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very fair question. Uh, and that answer dates back to um, the aftermath of World War II and the U.S. doubled down on the production of nukes, partnering with a company called Dow Chemical, you might have heard of. Um, the Atomic Energy Commission, as it was known at the time, um, built a nuclear production facility at Rocky Flats, which is a plateau about 15 miles northwest of Denver. Um, it was, you know, built in a very idyllic, beautiful, open, windy plain. And that part in the proximity to Denver is going to become super important later. <clears throat> Fallout. This is still very early days of nuclear technology, nuclear production. And there was both a need to expand uh, and to create more opportunities to refine those techniques. Yeah. I, OK, that's that's on me. Uh, I used a a little bit of like HR language. If you've ever worked in corporate America, you know how HR representatives uh, phrase things like areas of opportunity, which means you're not doing well in something. When we say refined techniques, what we're saying is this construction predates the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. It's very old. And at the time, people didn't know as much as they know today about how to safely handle nuclear material, about how you're supposed to deal with the, the waste that's produced, you know, and, and they didn't know as much about the long-term effects uh, exposure can have to, to human beings. They weren't trying to do very dangerous things. They were trying to be careful, but this is still, like you said, Noel, this is the 50s. And let, let's remember, I mean, if anyone's familiar with the game Fallout, you know, like the, the that, that all takes place in the early 50s, uh, at least in the first game, when, you know, nuclear technology is being touted as like the wave of the future. We're living in the brave new world that is the future we all envisioned from like science fiction, the age of Adam. I've heard it described things like that. You know, it's all very buzzy PR driven, idyllic images of, you know, housewives that can have robots making their you know souffles for them uh but that was just like the pr line that was being sold you know there's a lot of hidden cost in this uh, advancement and also hidden danger because one thing that mankind tends to do is to plow forward you know uh, hell or high water without fully wrapping their heads around you know the ramifications of uh, what they have wrought yeah, exactly. That's the same drive that results in things like the double down sandwich, uh, but also it results in things like nuclear war. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, even, two you know, sides of the same coin, I might argue, you know? The yes. Double down yeah. On one nuclear um, war on the other. And both in their own way dangerous. But part of this, part of this point, the reason we're talking about this kind of like Jetson esque retro futuristic era is because there was a great need to be the dominant force in this technology. So the U.S. was pretty much after 
like the day World War II ended, the U.S. was already considering how to outpace its geopolitical rivals. So construction on this thing began in 1951, but by 1957, it had already become a huge facility, 27 different buildings, uh, all related to um, the manufacture of something called plutonium triggers, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, This facility also ran into problems very early on. 1957, that same year we just mentioned, a plutonium fire occurred and it wrecked part of the compound. Uh, One building known as Building 771 was absolutely contaminated. Plutonium made it into the atmosphere. All in all, Uncle Sam was looking at um, well over $800,000 in damage in 1957 money. And Noel, Matt, I think we take maybe a page from another show we do called Ridiculous History and look at the inflation calculator, right? Let's run the numbers. (laughs) Okay, so $818,000 in 1957 is worth $8,184,308.33 today. So this was not inexpensive Uh, They also had to build a custom-made on-site incinerator to process all the contaminated waste. And the thing about plutonium, which I was not aware of for a long time, is that shavings of plutonium can also just spontaneously combust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's (laughs) dangerous stuff. Uh, It's interesting that every time, whenever you get into stories about dealing with, with nuclear materials... You realize how many problems are created by this technology, you know, just like every step of the way, you know, there's so much potential for contamination and then you have to create a whole new system like this incinerator and on site way of keeping things kind of sequestered. Otherwise, uh, it'll get out of this ecosystem, you know, this bubble that you've created in this uh, facility. And uh, it often does because the stuff is so easily um, carried by wind and water and uh, heart. And uh, I am Captain Planet. Um, Captain Planet would frown on this uh, type of behavior, you know? Uh, Oh, yeah. This is I'm sure this is in no small part part of the motivation for the creation of Captain Planet. But still, they needed this technology. They needed to be the number one player in this field. They being the U.S., Uncle Sam. And so expansion continued. But problems continued as well. What I'm saying here is the expansion of the facility continued Uh, at a fast pace, and the expansion of problems did the same. Uh, Throughout the 1960s, we see issues. Just 10 years after that first plutonium fire in 1967, people working at the plant find this massive stash of barrels, like 3,500-something barrels that are holding lubricants and solvents that have all been contaminated uh, with uh, radiation. And the workers find out, oh, this stuff has been leaking. We don't know how it's how long it's been leaking, but it's definitely in the ground now. It contaminated the soil and the top of the soil. Remember how we said it was important to remember there's a windy plateau. The top of the soil is getting scooped up in the air and it's blowing to, you know, it's traveling with the wind, which is easy and breezy for that. But it's very bad for people who because, you know, people don't deal well with plutonium. Yeah, plutonium doesn't have a goal doesn't care (laughs) where it goes it's just uh very easily transmitted and it just kind of like finds its way to wherever it's carried uh and then can create really serious problems for the communities surrounding that and you know it's insidious too right it can get into groundwater and then that you know is a whole system in and of itself that can then be carried much farther than you might think and sometimes it's not even clear how far the stuff does get carried right away or especially if you don't even realize and that the barrels were leaking, that it's even being carried in the first place. And then you can't put that uh, genie back in the bottle at that point. And then it's all just like they call them super fund sites where they have to clean this stuff up. And that can take generations. Oh, yeah, indeed. And this is not even we haven't even gotten to one of the biggest disasters on, on, on May 11th, 1969. Just two years later, there was a fire in building 776 uh, and 777 that would go on to become the most expensive, costliest industrial accident in the entire history of the U.S. up to that point. Uh, and both of these incidents, that fire in 57 and that fire in uh, 1969, 
are dangerous because plutonium is pyrophobic. Those shavings can just catch on fire. They can spontaneously combust. It took two years just to clean up what happened in 1969 or just to clean up, you know, the wreckage of it. And this led Congress to say, okay, yes, we want nuclear power. Yes, we want to be a nuclear capable nation, but we got to do something. This is dangerous. Um, We should also point out that Congress wasn't closing the place down. That was considered a non-starter at this point. Instead, they needed to find a way to mitigate the danger. So they approved the purchase of a buffer zone. It's like 4,600 acres around the plant in 1972. So everything's fine, right? It's the shortest episode we've ever done. Uh, The the plant manufactured 70,000 plutonium bomb triggers for the U.S., and everyone is fine. Mm -hmm. The robot made the souffle, and it did not fall. Um, Mm -hmm. no, no, there's more, um, that disaster, by the way, that fire that you're referring to, um, I believe there are some in the field that refer to it as like the American Chernobyl, um, in that it could have been much, much worse than, than it ultimately was, but it had the same makings of a widespread, uh, disaster, but we're, we're going to see it wasn't fully contained. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, those leaks and all that contamination, it just continued. It it wasn't like, you know, nipped in the bud, as they say. Uh, And eventually, Rockwell International took over management of the site from Dow Chemicals. And nearby, Denver, just like the plant, was also expanding. I mean, we got to think about what part of the country this is. Like, there was a time where this was very rural and very, you know, like few and far between in terms of, like, metropolitan development, right? And Denver is kind of, we want to be a major city. We want to, you know, uh, move it on up and all that. Um, so it was being expanded as well. Um, and eventually, these two entities would come into closer contact, Uh, And like you said, Ben, this really is just the beginning of the story and the part, you know, before the thing that we always Mm -hmm. say. So we're going to pause here for a word from our sponsors. and We're diving further into the soil of Rocky Flats. Here's where it gets crazy. Uh, We are going to talk about Rocky Flats, but this is also a meta. Here's where it gets crazy moment. You may have noticed our good pal, Matt Frederick, uh, was a little bit uh, a little bit less verbose than usual. Uh, Matt has had to step out, uh, but he he knows this story. Uh, He is going to be back very soon. We just wanted to let you know that there's no no conspiracy on our end. He just had to he had to uh, put out a fire real quick. Not a plutonium fire. Not, not a nuclear <laughs> fire. Hopefully. Right. Um, but yeah, we hope that he returns before we finish this one up. Uh, so the contamination of the Denver area by plutonium from those fires and other sources wasn't. This is where the Chernobyl comparison comes in. Um, wasn't reported publicly until the 1970s. Yeah, Let that sink in for a minute. Yeah. Now, of course, of course, locals in the area know about these problems and it it employs a lot of people. Right. There are people who work there for decades. Uh, But when we say the public, we mean the general American public, like somebody in Missouri or somebody in Seattle or what have you. Uh, This begins to spark an acrimonious and very public argument. And it culminates in a a kind of a series of alleged conspiracies. First, let's introduce John Lipsky. In 1989, John Lipsky is an FBI agent who leads a raid on the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant in Colorado after the FBI gets reports that say this thing is a huge public health risk. And John Lipsky really sticks to his guns on this one. He is he's motivated by what he sees as a great danger to innocent people. The raid, like when you picture a raid, you usually picture a really quick kick door and it's like one and done and it's over in 30 minutes or something like the action part of it. But this raid took 18 days. There were more than 100 FBI and EPA officials And then it sparked a three-year criminal investigation into widespread contamination all over the place, not just the site, 
but the surrounding suburbs of Denver. And even this raid itself is like home to a conspiracy theory. People are saying that the Department of Energy got a heads up that they were going to get raided. And there was a former employee I saw quoted who said, look, this is a place where there were armed security guards. We wanted to protect the nuclear material. So if we didn't know they were coming, those agents would have been met with automatic weapons and some people would have died. So we don't know the extent of like cooperation between the DOE and the FBI in that raid, but whatever they found, even if it was, and they found a lot of egregious stuff, but even if it was already kind of covered up, um, it was enough that it was enough that the DOJ Department of Justice looked at it and they said, we are assembling a special grand jury to investigate the evidence against people working for the government and against Rockwell International. That's the private defense contractor we mentioned just a second ago. They managed the site from 75 to 1989. The site stopped making plutonium triggers at that point. Um, when they went to court, Rockwell pled guilty to some stuff, some counts of negligence. They paid a fine. They paid $18.5 million. Uh, that might not sound like a lot, but at the time, it was the biggest environmental penalty ever. Well, again, with the inflation calculator, I mean, that's like, you know, probably close to 30, 40 million. 38 million. You're not far off. Yeah, inflation's a hell of a thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a dice roll. Um, ben, do you have a sense from the, the documents that are available publicly, like, where what was the origin of the negligence you know like just not monitoring these barrels just not having a good sense of what was going on in different parts of the plant i mean because again we know that this was the early days of like epa regulation was it provable that they like broke some kind of like really codified statutes that they were supposed to be sticking to i'm just interested in you know yeah this so they were at the very least cutting a lot of corners, right? Mm. And uh, the the typical accusation would be that they were putting profits over people. Um, they weren't doing due diligence when they were cleaning up this stuff, that they were illegally dumping things uh, in places where the, the public was unaware of it but could still be affected. You know, as you referred to earlier, the water contamination, the soil contamination, these are serious things. I think stick out stick around for a long, long time. So they do plead guilty to some stuff and the case gets settled in this plea bargain with that fine. But agent Lipsky is certain they're not telling the full story. They're not talking about the full extent of the contamination and the full extent of their crimes. Also the department of justice ultimately sealed the uh, findings from that grand jury. Yikes. So my question is almost moot. I mean, we know we know a few things based on what they did cop to, but a plea deal is always so interesting to me because it uh, lets people off the hook for a lot of stuff because they have the power to give the investigating body something else that they want, you know? Um, and it's a little bit of a quid pro quo situation that doesn't really result in justice being carried out. Yeah, unfortunately, that that is something that's in the cards in some of these situations. And Lipsky, as we said, is not satisfied with this. Uh, he eventually leaves. He resigns early from the FBI because as a result of this, uh, he is not alone in his allegations either. There are people like Dr. Leroy Moore, a Boulder theologian, and Wes McKinley, who is the foreman on that grand jury and then later um, was involved more often in uh, Colorado politics, these folks all agree that there's more to the story. In fact, McKinley goes on to quote John Lipsky in a book he co-authors called The Ambushed Grand Jury. It's written with a lawyer named Karen Balcony, and they are absolutely like they're mapping out the cover up and the conspiracy. And the book opens with an excerpt from a letter John Lipsky wrote to Congress in 2001. It's an open letter. Um, we've got an excerpt here, and it sounds like the stuff of cinema. It sounds incredibly dramatic, uh, and it also sounds incredibly sincere. And Noel, I was thinking uh, maybe we could just just read the first part of this letter. Absolutely. 
Quote, I am an FBI agent. My superiors have ordered me to lie about a criminal investigation. I had it in 1989. We were investigating the U.S. Department of Energy, but the U.S. Justice Department covered up the truth. Yeah, he goes on to say, I have refused to follow the orders to lie about what really happened during that criminal investigation at Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant. Instead, I have told the author of this book the truth. Her promise to me, if I told her what really happened, was that she would put it in a book to tell Congress and the American people some dangerous decisions are now being made based on that cover up. And again, because of the sealed documents, there's really no way to verify these claims that this that this this guy is making. I mean, we know he was there. We know he was really involved. We also know he'd probably have an axe to grind. It would be pissed about the way it turned out uh, and would have good reason to kind of sling mud. Um, but I, I don't know. It seems it seems uh, pretty likely that <laughs> what he's saying is true. What, what do you think? Ben? Yeah, I I am team Lipsky on this one because we do, even though it was sealed, we do know the broad strokes of the jury's findings and reports because it was leaked to Westworld magazine and they published, they started publishing about it in 1992, in late September, 1992. And what they found was that the special grand jury had, put together indictments charging three officials at the Department of Energy, five employees at Rockwell with environmental crimes. And they also wrote a report that that was intended to reach the public in the U.S. and abroad. That that stuff got sealed. And this is where we see a lot of the origin of the allegations here for cover up locals, various scientists studying the area confirmed the contamination spread further than most folks might have imagined. It's like as far back as 1972, you see folks like radio chemist Edward Martell saying, quote, and this is from a study he co-published in the more densely populated areas of Denver, where he notes the plutonium contamination just east of the Rocky Flats plant ranges up to hundreds of times that from nuclear tests. Meaning that if you are in this area in 1972, it's more dangerous than being in an area after a nuclear test, which boggles Yikes. the mind. Yeah. Yeah. And again, again, you know, we it's hard to clean this stuff up. It's harder even maybe than like cleaning up an oil spill which we know is really hard because this stuff is like a lot harder to detect. It's not just like a material that you can see with your eyes and use stuff to soak it up. Um, it requires years of mitigation. I mean, you know, I think I've talked about in the past that, you know, when I was a beat reporter for Georgia public broadcasting, I would do nuclear stories because of where I was. We had like uh, the Savannah Riverside in um, uh, Plant Vogel and Savannah Riverside is considered a super fun site because they, you know, would store all this legacy nuclear waste from the manufacture of nuclear weapons. And it is a site that, that scientists are continuing to monitor over the years. This is a project that's been in the works for decades and they have to monitor the wildlife. They tag these like turtles and other native species uh, and release them. And then they pick them back up and take them and measure them with like Geiger counters to make sure that their radiation levels are like dropping. Um, it's really hard once you let this stuff out into the environment. Yeah, it is. It is immensely difficult and there's not really a safe, fast way to do it. Right. Uh, you're looking at a, you know, a, you're looking at a, a timeline that extends for decades. So Lipsky and others who allege this cover up, uh, and again, I'm biased and very much on their side in this situation. They they start, they continue raising alarms, waving those red flags about the danger to locals. And Salon picks up on this and they wrote a great article in 2005, which you can read online. An excerpt here uh, will give us a picture of what the critics are saying. Uh, the critics say that the DOE wanted to keep the public in the dark to cut corners on cost not to mention protect itself from criticism for environmental negligence. The department allocated $7 billion to the cleanup, and that was a sum initially criticized as far too low to enable a, a thorough job, they say. And then they also point out 
at least the critics say, that less than 8% of the allocated $7 billion there is being used to actually decontaminate the site. The rest of it's going to admin cost and decommissioning cost. Dude. that i mean seriously maybe just don't spill the toxic waste in the first place Mm -hmm. maybe just like know what you're getting into and not have to commission billions of dollars to maybe clean up your mess yeah exactly it It just seems so wasteful considering how penny pinching governments can be with this kind of money and how they won't spend money on like education for kids and stuff but yet they'll spend eight billion dollars to clean up something they caused (laughs) it makes me i'm sorry it makes me very very mad yeah this uh, this also affects the employees of the Rocky flat site they've gone public with stories that say things like um The cleanup purposely excluded known dumping grounds. They've also questioned the methods used to decontaminate the area or even to measure contamination. Uh, I want to introduce another person mentioned in that Salon article, Jackie Brever. Uh, Jackie was a long-term employee at Rocky Flats. She was working in what are called the hot areas where there's a risk of exposure and She is one of the many folks who have tragically developed cancers that are typically tied to long-term exposure to radiation. And in her case, she said it was incredibly difficult for her to get financial assistance because some of the key records that prove her exposure had been, her words here, suppressed. You mean like in the sealed documents that we were talking about earlier? Yeah, kind of like saying, hey, uh, you have no evidence that you have no evidence that Rocky Flats is the cause of what's happened to you. And then you say, I do have evidence. You just won't let anybody see it. And they say, well, it's sealed. It's over in that folder over there, bro. No, Uh -uh. not that one. (laughs) Sealed, sealed, (laughs) signed, sealed, delivered. Uh, Not yours anymore. Jesus, it's so weird, man. Uh, yeah. Oh so God. I want to see what I want to see what everybody thinks about this because th- the legal battles continue. There was a class action lawsuit, a huge class action lawsuit called Cook versus Rockwell International, and was filed in January 1990 against Rockwell and against Dow Chemical. Interestingly enough, I didn't know this, but nuclear contractors have a kind of indemnity baked in in this country, which means that. Uh, the class action lawsuit, any fees associated with that would be paid by the federal government, not paid by those folks specifically, Dow and Rockwell. Cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah. You're going to feel great after this one. So so uh, this legal battle goes on and on and on. And eventually the plaintiffs who are the plaintiffs are like 13 to 15,000 property owners Uh they are eventually awarded $926 million in punitive and economic damages. Uh, There's another approval for a $375 million settlement in May of 2016. Uh, And it goes on and on, but things come to a head in September of 2010. The 10th Circuit Court of Appeals reverses that $926 million decision. And then two years later, the Supreme Court declines to hear the case. So if you think there's a cover up, this sort of stuff looks a lot like a smoking gun, right? Like the Supreme Court's not going to listen to you. You get you get an award in a class action lawsuit, but then that gets thrown out on a procedural thing, by the way, um, which is, you know, if people don't know, often uh, when a case is thrown out on appeal, It's because of a procedural thing, not because they said someone was evil or whatever. Chain of custody, you know, was broken in handling evidence or whatever, like uh, something, some technicality, you could call it, which is just infuriating. But as is often the case with, uh, you know, instances of corporate or government malfeasance, you know, where the public health is concerned, um, plenty of studies have shown a connection, one one would argue, you know, or at the very least, excessive rates of cancer, birth defects, and other chronic health problems among local residents. But 
for some reason or somehow like the idea of a direct link to Rocky Flats has never been conclusively established. But I don't know. It, it just seems like um, semantics to me. You know, I don't know, Ben. What do you think? About yeah, that? there's a uh, there's a lot to unpack here. You and everything you said, I completely agree with. Uh, we're going to pause for a word from our sponsor. And when we come back, we'll also have a special returning guest. And we have returned. We have returned uh, not just uh, not just with Nolan Ben, but with our guest, a returning guest, Matt. We called you earlier. <laughs> so okay. It's <laughs> our show anyway no we just uh we just let people know that you had a fire drill that you had to step away from uh but mm -hmm. we're really glad you made it back on this episode and noel you pointed out something awesome when we we're on break or not i i it's just true matt you may have dodged a, a depression bullet here oh well <laughs> i i I'm aware of the material, so uh, <laughs> I I'm feeling it already. And just for our drinking drinking game purposes, the nature of my fire drill had to do with my wife, who I learn a lot from. <laughs> oh, yeah. there we go. <laughs> glug glug. Uh, a little early for me, but I'll make the glug sound. Well, well, you got here. You got back in time for the cancer, Matt. There's that. Uh, so <laughs> we talked about we we've talked about. Um, the legal battles that were occurring. We've talked about the mission of folks like uh, former FBI agent John Lipsky, and we've also explored some of the disasters that occurred across the history of the plant site. But now we're we're at the point where we have to talk about the numerous locals and former employees of Rocky Flats who say exposure to this very dangerous, nasty stuff that was not ever quite handled correctly. Uh, they say it has given them excessive rates of cancer, birth defects, other medical conditions. And there is a lot of dispute right now about the veracity of all those claims because you'll see that studies don't agree. Some studies do indicate higher rates of cancer amongst uh, former employees. Other studies say you can't establish a direct link. And I want to see what we think about this because just to pull one study, this, this is instructive for our, us to ask ourselves about sources. Uh, one study from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment's Cancer Registry said, after two assessments, one in 1998, one in 2016, they said, quote, the incident of all cancers combined for both adults and children was no different in the communities surrounding Rocky Flats than would be expected based on cancer rates in the remainder of the Denver metro area from 1990 to 2014. So they say, you know, they couldn't find a solid quantitative link or correlation here. But if you're someone who believes that not only was there a cover up, but that the cover up continues today, you got to question the source. It reminds me of, of um, the, you know, the the city in Russia that continues to mine asbestos and the studies that were sanctioned by the government there that indicate that, ah, oh, there's no don't worry about cancer. It's fine. Let's just keep the asbestos coming um and there is a vice piece where the reporter you know was kind of shut out by um the uh, organization that did those kind of government sanctioned studies so uh, this feels like that to me where it's like of course the government of of colorado well maybe not of course but something like the, the colorado department of health it's it's an agency tied to the federal government in a sense and it would make sense they might be on board yes but it doesn't explain the varying results that come back when soil is sampled at numerous places in Rocky Flats. Consider reporting coming out of KUNC, the NPR station in northern Colorado. Uh, in 2019, there was a statement put out by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment that said one of the soil samples had an elevated level of plutonium. Uh, and that again, this is 2019. And then upon further testing, because they asked for another 25 samples after those came back, uh, they all they all tested at three picocuries per gram, which is below the cleanup standard of 50 picocuries per gram. So 
it's, it is weird that one random sample out of 25 comes back as highly elevated in plutonium, but then all the further testing is fine. It just makes you wonder if there are tiny spots, you know, tiny pockets that still have elevated levels of plutonium. Little hot pocket plutoniums, right? <laughs> well, but I mean, that, that, that's sort of the issue we've been talking about all along. This stuff is really hard to pin down, mm-hmm. you know? Because it's insidious. I mean, it doesn't like affect everything the same way. But if it affect if if it's if there's any amount of it within a given area, then it can be really really dangerous. So it's such a problem to like really zero in and find it. Uh, and it probably makes it easy to kind of you know juke the stats right as well. Right. Oh, we did we we did enough we did enough samples. See, we're fine. But that doesn't mean that you caught it all because you don't know exactly where all it goes. It kind of just goes where it's taken. You could also. You know, I'd also draw an analogy to fire. Um, if you walk into a field that is on fire, you will know it's on. You will know it's on fire probably before you get there, and you will be conscious of being harmed. But if you walk into a place that is irradiated, you're you're not going to know for a while unless you have the right equipment or unless uh, the. Uh, w- what I'm saying is the threshold for you to immediately know, hey, something is wrong, that that threshold is much higher than the threshold at which you will be harmed by contamination. You can get contaminated, you will not know, similar to asbestos as well, uh, and there will be long tail consequences. So yes, this is, this is dangerous stuff. The EPA uh, went out in, I think it was 2007, they said, okay, our cleanup of Rocky Flats is complete. So therefore, we don't need to continue monitoring for contamination. And now if you go to the area, the physical remains of the plant are long gone. It has two distinct, it, it's divided into two distinct places now. There's one called the COU or Central Operable Unit. This includes like the um, hot radioactive beating heart of the site. It's off limits. It's a super fun site. It's owned and managed by the DOE, Department of Energy. And then there's the refuge, the wildlife refuge. How adorable. Uh, The Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge is owned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So part of this, yes, dangerous nuclear site, don't go. But pretty much across the street, go. Hang out with the animals. Go frolic. You know what I mean? Smell that fresh, fresh, sparkly air. So if the cleanup really was done uh, with the due diligence required, and if it is complete, then theoretically, there should be not much to worry about with this refuge. You should be able to go out and walk the trails or go there on a field trip, et cetera. But the problem is people are convinced the cleanup was incomplete, whether through incompetence, whether through purposeful, um, purposeful downplaying to avoid PR disasters. And they'll tell you that the area is not safe for the public. We had a lot of listeners uh, write in or communicate regarding this. Uh, and we also had, um, we, we also read a great deal of the, of the ongoing efforts to cl- like ongoing efforts to close down the refuge uh, as recently as November of last year. The thing is, even if those buildings that were part of the site are not there, the legacy of Rocky Flats nuclear past remains. And if you don't think the cleanup was complete, if you think there was a cover up of the cleanup, then the idea of this contamination becomes a lot like a ghost. It's like you bulldoze the house, but the ghost remains. Uh, And the lawyer we mentioned earlier, Balcony, made some really powerful points about this problem. And Essentially, she's saying it's bigger than just Colorado. It's bigger than the spot 15 miles away from Denver. The Rocky Flats cleanup, she says, could be used to fuel what she characterizes as a myth that nuclear waste can be safely handled. So come in a plutonium playground on the way to you is what she's saying. Yikes. <laughs> That's fun. That's fun alliteration too, Ben. Um, also, I, I have to say, some of the the, the, the terms in, in nuclear are very interesting. I, I love the idea of a super fun site because every time I hear it, it sounds like you're saying super fun. 
which also sounds like a playground kind of situation. <laughs> like, I was thinking it's a super fun site. I always think of the super friends as well. Yeah. Also true. Yeah, it's nice. true. That's the thing. I mean, there is, there's, there are certainly t- ways of handling nuclear material more safely and trying to contain it. But the problem is once it really gets out of that containment area and into the environment, then as we know, it's like uh, playing whack-a-mole, you know? Like you just, it, it, you never really, really know, like in, in a reasonable amount of time, if you've gotten them all, gotten it all, you know? Uh, and that's why it requires constant testing and funding for years and years and years just to be able to say, we think we got it all. We and hope still we might it. not have. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has, uh, Balkany had this great quotation where she sums up the situation. She says, quote, I believe the main goal of the DOJ and the nuke industry at Rocky Flats is greenwashing. It helps both nuclear powers and the nuclear weapons industries to convince people that industries and governments can deal with their waste in a safe way. That's tough because the world does need to have nuclear energy. You can't really walk it back at this point. Um, If everybody dismantled all of their nukes, which has been, you know, the goal of activists for a long time, then you know what's going to happen the next week is those same countries. Some of them are going to start racing to be the only country that has nukes now, right? The world is in, that's what, that's what mad is. Mutually assured destruction is really like the old scene in Westerns where there's a standoff and three people are pointing guns at each other or the Spider-Mans are all pointing at each other. Like, no, you're, I'm Spider-Man. You're, you know, that's what's happening. There are a lot of anti-nuclear activists in general, But to be clear, this situation is different. This is about an alleged multi-generational, decades-long cover-up. And honestly, it looks pretty plausible. That's just my take. It it does look like a cover-up. I want to offer not a counterpoint to it, but uh, a way to think about the real risk to human life here. And it, come, it goes back to that KUNC article of the NP, NPR article that I mentioned earlier. And it comes in the form of a statement from Lindsay Masters, who is an environmental protection specialist who works at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. She notes after crunching the numbers of you know possible exposure over time that, quote, if you lived at Rocky Flats for 13 years, 13 years, and the soil everywhere had plutonium concentrations of 20 picocuries per gram, your risk of cancer would only increase by about 1 in 100,000. And 1 in 100,000 isn't necessarily a bet that, you know, you want to take when it comes to, a you know, <laughs> something with such a high mortality rate as cancer. But the messed up thing that Masters points out is that we all have a normal average risk of getting cancer of about 30%. Every human being on the planet has a one in three chance of getting cancer at some point in their life. So to that point though, Matt, it also makes the stats hard to, to kind of dig into, you know, because that's pretty high. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. One in (laughs) one in three chance of getting cancer. Mm. So unless like, you know, everyone in the surrounding area gets cancer, like within a year, it's really hard to dig through that data and draw a correlation, you know, or, or, or causation. Yeah, there's some, uh, I, I would almost call it forensic work you can do, because as we've said before, cancer is a group term. It's an umbrella phrase. Not all cancers are the same. Not all, the, not all cancers are created equal, which is why there hasn't, to this point, been a cure-all, a panacea for things described as cancer. But what you can do is correlate certain types of cancer to certain causes, right? The same way that the same way that in the world of asbestos, there are medical conditions that the vast majority of the time occur because of asbestos exposure. They're they're even in the name of the condition. So you can do that with certain types of cancer as well. But we also have to remember that this these measurements, uh, there's a lot of solid work done to try to account for various other environmental factors. But these measurements are not taking place in a lab in a 
you know, in a clinically controlled environment, people are exposed to a lot of other stuff too. That's, that's part of the issue here. But uh, the only way to reach those conclusions is to do some serious long-term measurement and, and monitoring. And that's tricky because the results can sink from the news. People like quick solutions. They like quick conclusions. You know, they like, they like feeling like it's, uh, I've spent five minutes, so I pretty much got it, you know, and everything else should conform to my opinion afterwards. But that's not the case. It gets really complicated. In the minds of people who are opposed to this refuge approach, the issue, is, it's bigger than rap. The issue is the tragic multi-generational contamination, not just of one area, but of multiple areas in the future. If this works, if there is indeed a cover-up and the full extent of the damage is not addressed, the way like Lipsky has pointed out, what could stop the U.S. government from taking this approach with other nuclear waste sites? We started today's episode saying, what, are, what is Rocky Flats? Why should I care? Here's why you should care. It's easy to ignore these sorts of issues if they are far away from you, but you have to ask yourself, how comfortable would you be knowing that your kid's local playground that you go to uh, every day or every weekend used to be a toxic waste dump? And you got a little paper Everybody in your neighborhood got a, got a little thing in the mail saying it's fine. Is that enough for you? Because <laughs> it's not enough for me. I'm just being very clear about that. <laughs> yeah. It, or, yeah. My son would not be playing there. But, but again, like it. Oh, it's messed up because it very well could be fine. Uh, but I don't have the time to go run sample tests. 250 soil sample tests <laughs> at a playground. Mm-hmm. And and also, this is not to say that everybody in these alphabet agencies we've mentioned is like part of some grand conspiracy. But when you hear people say there is a cover up, want you to know that they're not just saying that for attention. They're not just making that out of some desire to improvise fiction. They are <laughs> they are basing this on some very troubling things. And as recently as last year, efforts to close down the refuge continue. At this point, we pass it to you, fellow conspiracy realists. What do you think? How safe can places like this be over the long term? Could there be even more stuff they don't want you to know about Rocky Flats? We have a lot of proponents of nuclear technology in the crowd today. Uh, So love to hear that view as well. Uh, We also wanted to thank Again, just the many, many people who've written in with their own accounts of Rocky Flats. I particularly want to shout out Logistical QI, who has written to us about this several times, talked about, um, talked about activist groups like the Rocky Flats downwinders, so the people who get exposed to plutonium when it blows into the sky, and uh, just, some, just some great stuff that you sent us. So thank you so much, and thank you to everyone else. We can't wait to hear your thoughts. We try to be easy to find online. That's right. You can find us online under the handle Conspiracy Stuff on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also join our Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy. If you want to find us on Instagram, you can search for the handle Conspiracy Stuff Show. If you want to stay away from social media and instead use your phone for its intended purpose, do it. Call us, 1-833-STDWYTK. You have three minutes to leave a message. Please give yourself a cool code name, whatever you want it to be. Bonus points if you make us laugh with it and your message in general. Uh, Say whatever you'd like, uh, but it is very important that you give us permission to use both your name and your voice message on the air. If you've got more to say than can fit in that three minutes, why not instead consider sending us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.